Augustine is certainly one of the easiest theologians to become involved with when you're studying theology, at whatever age that might be. I think this is probably true of a lot of the theologians of the early church. It used to be that they were regarded as a preserve of high scholarship, and that's still true. But I think more and more ordinary Christians, as it were, are discovering that the fathers, or the, as the early theologians are called. And this is partly because they are still so close to scripture. This is before all the, the many theological debates of the subsequent centuries have formed. And these are theologians who are primarily trying to work out what is the witness of scripture, who is Jesus Christ, how do we read the Bible, how do we read our Christian lives. And this is certainly true of Augustine. Augustine is an African theologian, and we need to remember that the early church, uh, and indeed Christian's foundation, was as an African and Middle Eastern church. Christianity we think of as being a European religion, but it's actually an Oriental religion. So by the third century there were uh, dozens of dioceses in the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, but a country like Hungary only becomes Christian in the 10th century. The whole of North Africa was largely Christian. There were, of course, remaining so-called pagan groups and, um, in, in Augustine's time. And this is well before the rise of Islam in the 7th century, because Augustine's dates are 354 to 430. So I mentioned that the early theologians are close to scripture, and this is certainly true of Augustine. He was a bishop. He was a preacher. He wrote a number of larger theological treatises, but these were all in aid of his main task of being a bishop and being a preacher. A lot of his writings were in the forms of psalms, a lot of those who have come down to us and have been very influential in subsequent Christian history. Of course, he's one of the most influential early theologians of the Church, uh, embraced in his thought by both reformers and the Catholic tradition after the Reformation. Martin Luther famously was an Augustinian uh, theologian. He was an Augustinian monk and uh, trained in that, and his work is replete with the Augustinian ideas. So you can scarcely go wrong if you're reading Augustine. Even someone like Aquinas, who for many years was touted as the great Aristotelian thinker, we now realize is as deeply, if not more influenced by Augustine, more influenced by Augustine, I would definitely say, than he is by Aristotle. Well, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, Augustine's early life, as he himself tells us in the Confessions. Uh, this is a very good way to get into uh, Augustine, but also to get into theology, because Augustine wrote this book as a kind of apologia. He wrote it, it seems, to explain how it was his life had taken the turns it had to what might have been a skeptical audience, as I shall uh, indicate. And I would recommend to you, um, readily available also in paperback, this translation of Augustine's Confessions by Henry Chadwick with notes, and also a very beautiful translation, um, more recent, by Maria Bolding, The Confessions of St. Augustine. These are very good uh, additions to come in with the Chadwick. Both of them have excellent notes. And if you want a big commentary and the Latin, there's a free three volume. Uh, commentary by O'Donnell, which is very, very valuable and not hard to use. You don't have to read the whole thing. You can just say, oh, that part interests me. Let me zoom in on that. So don't be put off by the fact it's three volumes and lots of Latin. You can do it. Well, Augustine's Confessions is interesting as a piece of theology because it is in the form of a prayer how bold and brave it is. The whole thing is addressed to God throughout. A great prose prayer in marvelous Latin addressed to God, which we are somehow eavesdropping, overhearing as we go through it with Augustine. It's an immensely dense fruitcake of scriptural citations, particularly of the Psalms. In fact, I, I think that um, it's possible that if Augustine uh, if you took the Psalms, the citations of Scripture, out of this book, there wouldn't be much left of it. And then perhaps God could even sue Augustine for plagiarism, but I don't think this would really happen. So it's, it's a very dense amalgam of his own thought and scriptural words, as I shall say, in the form of a prayer, 
attesting to his adult conversion, his adult and dramatic conversion to the full Christian faith. And it's one of the classics, as I've said, of theology, but not only that, of all Western literature. It's without precedent in uh, Christian or pagan writings. Uh, there were biographical writings, there were autobiographical writings, but none of this nature. And of course, the very fact that it's addressed to God gives it a distinctive genre. It was written sometime around 397, 399. Augustine, as I said, is born in 354. So it's written when Augustine in his, is in his mid-40s, and it's some 13 years after the events it recounts. Augustine was by this time a bishop, 13 years from uh, zero to bishop in his case. He had not wanted to be a bishop. He had not even wanted to be a priest, but he had idly gone to the church in North Africa in Hippo Regis, a small town on the coast in 391, and been spotted there by the then aged Bishop Valerius, who forced ordination upon him, and four or five years later, uh, Augustine became Valerius' successor as Bishop of Hippo, which is a pretty small provincial town in North Africa. So he'd been a bishop for about 10 years at the time of writing this work. And the Confessions is widely regarded as the first of Augustine's mature Christian works, along with another book on Christian teaching, sometimes given in the Latin De Doctrina Christiana, uh, uh, The City of God, and, um, or at least the early books of these, and uh, it's one of the most important of Augustine's works, along with De Doctrina Christiana, The City of God, and his book on the Trinity. But I would say of these, The Confessions is the most loved. Well, why did Augustine write Confessions? And why 13 years after his conversion? Well, there seems to be more than one reason for this. Most of those inside the church and outside, because there were a lot of learned and sophisticated pagans in the region where he was bishop, knew about his colorful past. So in one sense, the confessions are confessions of sin. But for Augustine, they're more than this. They're a confession of faith, as we confess the creeds, I confess, and a confession of praise. They're also an answer to many questions, or an attempt to ask these questions. Who am I? Why am I here? What should I do? Questions that are questions for all of us, perennial questions, and I think this is part of the reason the text continues to attract. And I find it interesting that year after year, going through this text with 19-year-old students, everyone finds something valuable and interesting in it. The form of the writing, that it is in the form of a, of a prayer and a dialogue, Augustine is continually addressing God. So he doesn't say, who am I to himself? He says, who am I to God? Who are you, God? He's addressing, beseeching, crying out to God, brings us right into the content. He's speaking with his God. He seems on intimate terms with this God. He never has to explain this. He never stops and says, well, the reason I can be intimate with God is this, that, the doctrine of the Incarnation. It starts right in the middle. He's always already there, and you know who his, you don't know what his God is, but you know who his God is for him. This is the God who's already present, who's listening to him, and as we shall find, who Augustine believes has spoken to him. Who are you, my God? He asks, who are you, my God, at the beginning of the work, as though he expects God to answer this. And the way he proceeds is by laying before us his life. So it's a confession, but also an autobiography, both of which done in the first person. Well, I'm going to briefly take you through his life, and this is very much as given in the confessions, but I've complemented it a little bit by other work. He's born in November in 354 in North Africa, a town called Fagasti, in what is now eastern Nigeria. And as I've said, this was a Christian area of uh, Africa and, of course, part of the Roman Empire. Fagasti was a Roman town about 200 miles inland from the sea, and it was already quite an old settlement by the time Augustine was born. It had been around for some 300 years. We forget of the antiquity 
of these Mediterranean cities. In um, the third century AD, it had been a prosperous province, uh, rich with grain, traced by many roads. There were amphitheaters and baths that had all the appurtenances of a prosperous Roman uh, provin provincial town. But by Augustine's time, the fourth century, it was in decline. And by Augustine's time already, the whole of the Roman Empire was slightly menaced. It wouldn't be too much af later after the Confessions, 410 AD, that Rome itself was sacked. But going back to Augustine's childhood, Augustine's father was a Roman citizen. He was a free man, but not, uh, by all accounts, a wealthy one. He was a small farmer. That did mean that he had a household with servants and slaves. Um, he was also a pagan. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean in the context of the time that he, he worshipped a lot of random gods or indulged in cult, but he wasn't a Christian. Monica's mo uh, pardon me, uh, Augustine's mother, on the other hand, Monica was a devout Christian. And this is quite interesting because Monica, the name Monica, is a Berber name. Uh, she was possibly a native woman from the Berber people. And Augustine uh, seems to have spoken Punic, uh, a Semitic language of ancient Carthage, as well as Latin, which would have been his, um, his native tongue. Augustine apparently had a brother of whom he says almost nothing, and uh, of his father, Patrick, he says very little and not always very complimentary. But his mother, Monica, is virtually the heroine of the first nine books of the Confessions. Indeed, those are the autobiographical books. After that, he turns to an exegesis of the book of Genesis, commentary on space, time, memory. Um, so you might say that since on, uh, Monica figures so largely in the first nine books, which end with her death, that she, this is not just